Good evening. Praise the Lord. I mentioned this this morning with the other workers when I was at breakfast. I've been in the Adventist church all my life, all I've ever known. In my father's house, you never missed camp meeting, but we went every year. And this is the first time in my experience, Mr. President, that I have ever seen the Big Ten at camp meeting filled to capacity each and every night of the week. This is a first. Give God the glory. Oh, yes, I, I've seen it filled many times on the weekend, Sabbath and Friday night. Folks who didn't really come to camp meeting would flood in on Sabbath, fog up the restrooms, and run out all the hot water. But this is a new experience for me. I don't know if you've ever seen it. We're consistently every night during a weeknight, which means people who are working in the morning who have not taken off from work to be at camp meeting, but they're making the sacrifice to drive out from town and from the various little villages around to be here in the presence of the Lord. This is extraordinary, folk. And I just wanted to say aloud to the Lord that I have not missed its importance. This is really something special. And of course, you know, I do not claim the credit for this. I am just thrilled that the Lord allowed me to participate and see it happen and be a part of it. I would just say one thing to you. Don't ever take less than this again for camp meeting. Come out. You've discovered this week that if you will come and yield yourselves before the Lord, he will serve your needs. I've been stopped going across this campus. As a matter of fact, I never can take more than three or four paces. That's all right. I like that. And you've been coming up, expressing to me what the Lord has done for you personally. Many times, you know, great meetings like this, People spend their time yearning for who isn't here. Oh, I wish so-and-so was here. You ought to hear this message. I wish my aunt was here. I wish my husband was here. That's not what I've been hearing from you this week. All I've been hearing from you is, thank God I'm here. <laughs> That's a thrill, isn't it? Yes. The only difficult thing is that two more days, it's over. And it already has started pulling at my heartstrings. Gotten to know some of you rather intimately. Even for an old flaming sanguine like me, I'm starting to remember names. <laughs> if you weren't in my family session, you don't know that family joke that we have together. But the ones that were there know what I mean. But I'm starting to remember you, and I'm starting to hook names to faces. Jesus must be coming soon. <laughs> I'll get another chance to say this, but you become very precious to me. I shall not forget you. I will continue my prayers in your behalf, and I hope that you will remember me. When you come into your family circles and when you kneel in your private prayer closet, that you will call the name of Walter Wright. We don't, you don't, I don't have any idea where I'll be this time next year. But I hope that it's somewhere in God's service. It doesn't really matter to me where it is in the world. I soon discovered <laughs> as much as we're different, we're all alike. <laughs> Quite diverse, and that's great. Amen. Don't waste any time trying to get rid of the fact that you're different. You are different. Capitalize on it. Borrow from each other. Learn from each other. Internalize those differences. And give God the praise as you celebrate his wisdom in making us different. Amen. I used to think back how it used to be when I was a boy. We had a lot of racial bigotry in the United States. We've been successful in driving it all underground now. You notice I didn't say we got rid of it, but we've driven it underground. It's not popular to be a bigot anymore in the United States. Very unpopular. But I can remember back in the old days when every now and then they'd let us have a song or two on the program in the Big Ten. Not very often. Black folks, if you never could trust us, we might have a good time. <laughs> you didn't miss that, did you? <laughs> but every time we'd do one of those numbers and we'd have such a good time, and folk were watching us like uh, sort of spectators, Invariably, someone would come up afterwards and shake our hands and say, oh, I can't wait to get to heaven. I get there, I'm going to come over on the colored folks' side and hear y'all sing. <laughs> I ain't going to any segregated heaven. And to make sure I'm getting in practice down here. I'm learning to love you right now. Why, who knows? You might end up on my street. 
Got my spot picked out on Hallelujah Boulevard. Right near the intersection of Glory Lane. Come on my streets. You're going to have to have some love. Amen. 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 Well, I don't think that's what I came to preach about tonight. Seems like a good subject. You know why? Because you're doing so well. Now, you're not where you ought to be, but you're getting there. Did you sense the feeling of unity in this place last night? I can tell you didn't want to go home. You're just milling around. You just sat there for a while, dumbfounded. Slowly, we began to drift out to our tents and our rooms. Isn't that right? Reluctant to leave what God was doing. Marvelous experience. I challenge you again. Take it back to your churches. I warn you, not everybody was here. They didn't get what you got. And they're going to look at you a little funny at first. But go ahead and praise the Lord. I'm not suggesting that you keep up a ruckus in your church. but Don't let anybody squelch your spirit. Amen. Don't let anybody pour cold water on the marvelous experience that God has given you this week at the North New Zealand camp meeting. This has been a tremendous experience for all of us. And if we did less and perpetuate it, God would be displeased. Don't turn over this way. I seem to ignore you folk over here, and I want to quit that, okay? How y'all feeling over there? Wait a minute, let me walk over here and see how you're doing. You doing all right over here? You feel like you're part of the family? Okay, yeah, you're all right. I want to make sure. I have a tendency to preach to my right. Rights do that. Man, you have really sharpened up since last Sabbath. <laughs> I can't get anything by you anymore. You see that, Pastor? I was begging him to respond the other day, man. I can't get a thing past you. You're, you're right sharp. Praise God. That's what the Holy Spirit will do for you. Sharpens up your senses. Amen. Yeah, even black American preacher can't outrun you. That's wonderful. Let's take a moment. Talk to the Lord. I want to, if I may, I would like to set the theme of my sermon first and then. We'll have a prayer together. Exodus, the third chapter. We'll start with the first verse again. And you know what I'm going to do, don't you? Read a while. That's right. <laughs> Please follow along. I hope we form some good habit, habits this week of reading nice, healthy passages from the Word of God. Don't be in such a hurry to rush off. Read a verse or two and take it out of context and go off and cause somebody's life misery. Read enough above and enough below that you know what God's trying to say to you. Amen. Amen. It'll keep you out of trouble. Exodus, the third chapter, starting with verse one. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw nigh, nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard thy cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Zeb Jebusites. All these ites, these are all people of color. All the ites got a lot of pigment in the skin. Some of them are black folk, like the Canaanites. Terrible people, too. Really, awful folk. Verse 9, Now therefore, behold, 
And by the way, black folk were running the world in that time. We weren't any better than y'all are. <laughs> Don't you like these little extra things you get when you come out? Verse 9, now therefore, behold the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, who, 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 who am I that I, I should go, go on to Pharaoh and that, 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 that I should, should bring forth the, the children of, 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 out, of, out of Egypt? Moses got a little speech problem, hadn't he? Huh? Well, they taught me that when I was in kindergarten and Sabbath school. That's right. I didn't forget. He has a speech impediment. He's got a handicap. He can't believe that God wants to send him to talk to the king of a great nation. Look at verse 12. Don't you ever miss verse 12. And he said, this is God, certainly I will be with thee. Now that ought to be enough. We sing a song in the black church that says, I got Jesus. And that's enough. I got Jesus. And that's enough. But oftentimes it's not enough for us. And you'll see that in Moses. Certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt. Ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say, say unto them, the, 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 the God of, of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? Oh, don't you love this answer? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And to God, that seems like enough. But not for Moses. Moses goes on arguing with God. I can't do it. I, 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 I don't know how to. To talk well, verse 19, God says, I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. And the Lord said unto him, as Moses continues to argue with him in chapter 4, verse 1, and Moses answered and said, but, but, but behold, they will, will not be, be, believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for, for they will say that the, the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him in verse 2, What's that in your hand? And he said, a rock. And God said, throw it down. And Moses threw it on the ground. And immediately, it became a writhing, hissing, threatening snake. And it reared up before Moses with its head threatening and spitting at him. And the Bible says, Moses took off running. I'm with Moses. How about you? And then you hear the voice of God. Well, Moses, come back here. But Lord, it's a snake. Moses, come here. Pick it up. And then, no, 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 Lord. Pick it up by the tail. Now, if any of you know anything about snakes, you know you don't want to pick them up. But if you must, it won't be by the tail. Amen? Moses, pick it up. Uh, 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 uh. Pick it up, Lord. Yes, Moses. By, by, by the, the, the tail, Lord. Yes, Moses. God is good. All the time. It became a rod again. But you see, there comes a time in our lives when we just got to trust God, even if it doesn't make sense to you. You don't pick up a snake by the tail unless God says so. Amen. Then you trust God and you leave the rest to him. Now, I want to tell you this because this is important. By the way, my message tonight, conquering, what do you think? Good guess. Wrong, but a good guess. Take another guess. Wow. Excellent guess. Wrong again. Our subject tonight is conquering handicaps. Somebody had it over there. Conquering handicaps. Let's pray. Lord, please help us understand your message for us tonight. Most of us have encountered the problem we'll be dealing with this evening. Have mercy on us, Father, as we find relief and the power to conquer. I would ask you for a special favor tonight, Lord. I'd like you to send your Holy Spirit to bless this congregation. In a very special way, I want you to visit tonight with Leanne Clark. 
If you're in the audience, I don't know her, but you do. Very simple request I have for you, Father. Convince Leanne of who she belongs to. She needs to understand that by the purchase of Jesus' blood, all of us, including her, belong to you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you among the company of the handicapped? Most of us feel that we are. We realize that we have handicaps in the realm of the physical and the educational, the spiritual, the mental, and even the moral. We look at our handicaps and we say, God cannot and will not use me. Consequently, like Moses, we surrender to our handicaps and cease to be that which God intended fully for us to be. But most of us want to conquer these handicaps. We want to know how to rise above them. From the life of Moses, my friends, I believe that our Lord will share with us tonight two principles that will we will all need to follow if we're going to conquer these handicaps in our lives. And the first one, as we go right after it this evening, I believe that we can conquer handicaps if we refuse to believe our own personal evaluation of those handicaps. What am I saying? I'm saying the first thing you need to do if you're going to conquer handicaps is you have to doubt your own diagnosis. We're good at diagnosing ourselves, aren't we? Now, there's a reason that I'm suggesting this to you. You see, for 40 long and trying years, Moses had felt that God would never, ever use him again. For the man who was educated in Egypt's finest university, this man who had gone to the best schools and been trained in the culture of Egypt and actually was an heir to the throne of Pharaoh. This man finds himself away out on the backside of the desert, leading sheep, handicapped in his own mind. We should not believe our own evaluation of our handicaps because they are at least partially based on untruth. They're only partly true. Who am I, Moses says, that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And I said, hear the question in the back of his heart, can't you? Doesn't God remember I'm the guy that killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand? What in the world is he doing trying to send me back to Egypt? They're waiting for me down there. The minute I show up, they're going to lay hands on me and kill me. Yet God's taking the command, isn't he? I want you to go, Moses. I picked you. Many of us are quick to say to the Lord, Pick somebody else. Leave me alone. He told a living God that he was not able to do what he was requesting of him. Now, while we went over to the seminary, I think the first easy white reference they taught us, at least me, was this one. Christ Object Lesson, page 333. As the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. Whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength. All his biddings are enabling. Did you hear that? Whatever God asks you to do, she says that the will of man, when it cooperates with the will of God, your will becomes omnipotent. Oh, that's almost too much to stand, isn't it? All you've got to do is hook up your will, your plan, with God's will. And God's plan, and it becomes omnipotent. Do you know what omnipotent means? Tell me. Don't mumble at me. Tell me. All powerful. Absolutely. It means you got enough power to get done whatever it is God is instructing you to do. You ought to say amen to that. But we don't need to dally around anymore. We don't need to keep arguing with God as Moses did. He's trying to make a point with God. You don't seem to understand a lot of things, God. But you see, God understands everything. He knows you, he knows your weaknesses, he knows your ability. And you know what? He's not really much concerned about them. Because, you know, when somebody's got so much power that nothing is impossible for him, he doesn't waste a whole lot of time considering the limitations. Would you say amen? That's the God we know, and that's the God we are privileged to serve. So you need to quit relying on your evaluation of your handicap. First of all, because they're only partially based on the truth. He could mind a flock of sheep, this Moses, but he could never emancipate a nation in his own eyes. Thus, he wanted to believe the partial truth of his own evaluation of his handicaps more than he was willing to believe God's truth, God's evaluation. 
And I know by this time, some of you are seeing yourselves right in Moses' shoes because we have a tendency to do this same thing. When you say that you are physically or socially or spiritually handicapped, how do you know? Is this your own evaluation or is it God's? Did you arrive at this conclusion by comparing your abilities with the abilities that you see in other people? How else would you know what kind of standard are you using? Remember, God is not expecting you to come up to the standard that he has for someone else. He only expects you to rise to the standard that he has for you. And he's got one for every one of us. As a matter of fact, I think I spent enough time on that the other night to let you know that God, even in the trials and tribulations and tests and temptations that come to us, he is God and loving enough to customize even your temptations so that they never become more than you can bear. And his demands on you and on your life are never more than you can produce. We ought to not come short of what God's expectations are of us. Secondly, you shouldn't rely on your own evaluation of your handicap, not only because they're only partially based on truth, but because they're, pay, they're based on your past experiences. And if you look back over your life, you're bound to see some failures, isn't that right? And you can look back enough that you're afraid to go forward. At one time, Moses had been too quick and too impetuous in his desire to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And you know, he messed it up horribly, as I've already related. In his anxiety, he killed somebody, murdered them. That wasn't a command of God. And now we find him too reluctant to answer the call of God. First, too much of a hurry. Now we can't get him to move at all. So your past experiences will cause you sometimes to feel handicapped. Experiences of past failures. He had failed in his attempt before to free the people of God. And now this, there was no reason for him to think that the present was going to be any different. Secondly, the experiences of the past few years with Moses where it was kind of weighing on his mind too. You see, when a painful and vivid memory, with a painful and, and vivid memory, Moses recalled his fears of 40 years before. Since they would not listen to him then, then they would listen to him now. So why is God going to send me on this wild goose chase? Well, if you want to conquer handicaps, first, you have to quit trusting your own evaluation of your handicap. Secondly, and I told you there are only two, you have to start following the Lord's direction. The words, come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayst bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. These were terrifying words to Moses. This is the last thing he ever wanted to hear God say to him. How could he do it? And God see I'm handicapped? Surely, if he just listens to the talk a moment, he'll see that I'm not angry. So he related with the God. We have a tendency to do that. Now. We like to tell God things you already know. God, I'm not eloquent. And I'm slow of speech, Moses said. I have a hard time just getting out of words. I think it was so beautiful that later on God told him, said, listen, Moses, I'm going with you. I'm going with you. He said, you know what he said? I quote God. I'll be with your mouth. Isn't that wonderful? You see, God is that kind of a personal God. He zeroes in on what the problem is. You worried about your mouth, Moses? Okay, you already told Moses, I'll be with you, honey. That wasn't good enough. So he said, now, Moses, I'll be with your mouth. And he's back for us here tonight. Whatever it is, God will be as specific in the blessing as you are in the relating. Don't hold back from it. He wants to bless. He wants to relieve. He wants to redeem. He wants to lift you. He wants to rescue you. Follow the Lord's direction. It's a direction that is based on God's love. How surprised Moses must have been to see that angel of the Lord. Out there by himself, hiding from Egypt, figure he had gotten his, uh, what do we call that, in the first of protective custody. I'll never find my way out here in the middle of nowhere. I want to imagine what that was like. Kind of like the way you said you'd walk over here in the middle of the nowhere. Yeah, you can get out somewhere. You don't want to step out too far. Moses thinks he's well hidden. And it must be a shock to him not only to see a burning bush, but to hear his voice called out of it. And his name called out of it. It would have been a real curiosity. And it was for him. He said, I'm going to wait and see why this bush didn't burn up. But more than that, it must have been a real curiosity to hear a voice come out of it. And on top of that, it called him by name. You see, God is that way. He will come to you personally. And I like that. He, he doesn't have to deal with you. He'll see you out. If you are the one that's ailing, God is kind enough to come to you in the midst of a whole crowd. And everybody might miss the blessing like so many. I wonder who tuned up, you know? That's why I try to stay tuned up because I don't want to miss whatever God has for me. Following God's direction is based on God's promise. You see, God 
Jesus' knowledge of our handicap is pretty extensive. The Lord knew better than Moses the full extent of his handicap, his lack of prestige and authority, and his lack of eloquence. All of this was known to God, but this was not a problem. He still wanted to send him to rescue his people. And God also has a knowledge not only of our ability, but of our availability. Our abilities are important to the Lord, and I live as important as our availability. What am I saying? No matter how much weapon you are thinking about, be careful how you are available to God. He will make it clear. All his bidding are available. If he calls you, be ready to respond. Don't just be available. You see, that was the whole thing that changed my life. I didn't know what I was doing. I ran into a guy telling me about God and the things I thought it was, and it was really about my availability. And as soon as I made myself available to him, God began working miracles in my life. It may be something only that I don't know how to do. Is he talked to me during the day. I just believe God can do anything. He's not at your house, but even in the council of sin. Some of you bring the little silly police problem that you always forget. You have to fix it. You never know. I believe that. You know what? He's on the internet. He's already done such marvelous things. He doesn't got to keep proving himself to me over and over and over again. Like these people who used to hear look at Jesus. And Jesus would work and work miracles. The next day or two when Jesus would come back, they'd sit there and fall down and say, that's the people I pay attention to. You know? If your preacher does come up with a really long boring sermon on Sabbath morning, you're not just living last year next Sabbath. I mean, that next Sabbath, it's not going to be messed up when you do it again. Following the Lord's direction, not only are they based on God's knowledge, but these directions are backed by God's promise. God had to spend a great deal of time convincing Moses that his directions were backed by his promises. Promises that would not fail, promises that would not let Moses down. I think that's what troubles many of us. We think God's going to get us out of it and then take a lid off and leave us standing out there. And we are surely concerned about being embarrassed. All the plan was I'm running for this big battle this time to do it. And I was flying from Montana and Lake Ohio down to the river next to Ithaca and then in the end. Now, not many airlines do that. Not by four days and do so. Not a day. I had to run for this plan because I was late. I took off running, I had my little suit bag over the side and I was running. But by the time I caught this plane, and just as I was going through the door, I really got a whiff of this thing. The Lord, this plane shot down the aisle. It was a little bitty wheel. It was a very fast looking plane. You know, a plane that you see in all of them, they all sit low. Well, this one was a little tricycle, too big in the front, a little bit in the back. As I went through the door, I said, What is this wheel? I was out of breath. The plane took off, and we hit some turbulence, and that little old plane was just kicked all over the spot. And I had nerve to walk me a seven. Then I sat with my seven about five to two pounds of pressure. I got so sick, you know, from running and then not getting my breath and all, and then this turbulence and kicking us around out there. And I just felt like something really accidentally was about to happen. I was coming up with the hand of getting turning, and I got my hand, and the Lord gave me a hand of pulling back. I said, Lord, you know what I do? I told the Lord, I said, Lord, please don't let your servant be embarrassed. We do that to God, don't we? Try to put him on the spot. Lord, don't let your servant be embarrassed. I had my two fingers on that little bag, you know, on the front. I'm going to close the little bag in front of me, and I had to pop open it. I remember what the Lord blessed me. You know, he's good that way. He told me to bless all these things. You know I can trust him in that. So he come and said he was going to do it. So many times, we are hindered from doing for the Lord simply because we don't want to be embarrassed. Lord, I can't get up and say that I love you because you don't look like me. Yes, sir. Amen. It's just like saying amen out loud in the room. Somebody might come along and look. Oh, they will. Don't worry about that. We ain't worried too much about our personal image. Let me tell you something. When you get to the kingdom of heaven, you won't be so much about what somebody else is doing. You won't care how you look, how many likes you have, or speaks, or how many likes you have. I want to say in Christ to God, I think you're really going to care about anybody else looking. Not at all uninterested. Don't worry about your handicap. It's not going to overcome you. God has an answer for your life. He's ready to fix those things. He's ready to help you rise above them. The promises of God and His presence certainly all will be with you. That's a marvelous promise. What's another promise? promise of God's power. He says, not only will I be with you, not only will I give you the power to get something done. All responsibility God takes for our powerfulness. He doesn't do it for you. When you go out in the name of God to do something for him, he takes full responsibility for supplying the power and for the results. I always tell young preachers, especially ones that are privileged to talk to, some of them are sick there and they're about to go to heaven and they're on the first night. You know, I always caution them, brethren, please don't take any more credit souls you don't baptize than you do for souls that you do baptize. Look at that. You know, that's it. We have the tendency to, to train real nasty in our way. You know, you don't get baptized so that you don't take any credit. Right? You get water. If you only get water now and you think, well, if I get water, then you 
money pastor you know budgets are hard to come by and he'd gone down there and preached all these weeks and used up all these resources and he only had one soul and the poor brother was just colored he was just so discouraged because they just heaped it on him and oh you didn't do any good i don't know what in the world happened to you brother you surely must not have been prepared etc 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 i want to tell you tonight that the one soul he baptized was j h lawrence who became a seventh day adventist evangelist and responsible for over twenty thousand souls baptized the only guy he got was the guy that could prove 20,000 souls under the power of God just a few years later. How about that? And don't underestimate God. You can't get credit for either one, for the big number or the little number. It's all to the glory of God. Would you say amen tonight? All right, I'm closing. God also promises victory. Moses learned that a man plus God equals enough. How about you? Humanly speaking, Moses had many handicaps. Like yours, some were real, some were imaginary. But he was able to conquer them by the power of God. And he did, in fact, lead God's people forth. He joined the Lord. He made a, an alliance with God and became victorious. What about you tonight? Would you be willing to join God? Put away your worries about your handicaps? Listen to this. I want you to hear this. What did I do with it? Oh, this is, this is good stuff. Physical, mental, and moral powers. This is the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, November the 9th, 1897. Physical, mental, and moral powers are the endowments of God and are to be appreciated and cultivated. We are here on probation in training for the higher life. All heaven is waiting to cooperate with those who will be subordinate to the ways and will of God. God gives grace and he expects all to use it. He supplies the power if the human mind feels any need or any disposition to receive. He never asks us to do anything without supplying the grace and power to do that very thing. And again, she repeats, all his biddings are enablings. From Messages to Young People, page 101, the heavenly intelligences will work with the human agent who seeks with determined faith, that perfection of character, which will reach out to perfection in action. To everyone engaged in this work, Christ says, I am at your right hand to help you. you don't need to worry. All you need to do is enlist the power of God. I believe, as I said before, you can do anything. I told you last night that I, I might tell you about my experience baptizing in the river on Thanksgiving weekend. It had a little three-day meeting. It started on Thursday night after the, the big dinners that we have in America on Thanksgiving. Went down to the little church and we preached. And then Friday night we preached. And then Sabbath morning we preached. We opened the doors of the church for discipleship. And three men came forward. This is the strangest thing. I had no way of knowing it then. But all three of them became Adventist ministers. All of them. They're active now. But that day, these men came forward. And here's what they said. One was from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. One was from Washington, D.C. And the other one was from right there in our hometown of Dayton. But each man said, I've had an experience this weekend with the Lord. And I don't even want to go on the highway until I've sealed it with the Lord. Now, these were not strangers to the truth and the teachings of the Adventist church. In fact, two of them were rebaptisms. I want to set that straight. These were not people who didn't know what they were getting into. 
They said, we've got to be baptized. This was Sabbath morning. The temperature outside was 22 degrees. Now, that's not your 22 degrees. 22 degrees here is pretty nice, isn't it? But I'm talking about 22 degrees Fahrenheit, which meant all the rivers were frozen. The pipes had frozen and burst in many homes. It was cold. And when we turned on the taps, Layton, to run water into the church pool, we found those pipes had burst as well. No water. The men said, no, don't care what you do or how you do it. We've got to be baptized. So I told Elder C.D. Brooks, we can go down to the river where I baptize all summer. But I'll never forget old C.D. You know, he said, big voice. He said, but Walt, this is not summer. <laughs> well, I had a little travel trailer. You call them caravans here, right? I had a little caravan with a heater in it. I said, we'll use this as the dressing room. And here's what we'll do. We'll pray the power of God. We'll go down there next to that creek. We'll pull the caravan right up there. Got to get the heat on real good. We'll dash them into the water and dash them back into the caravan. They can pull those wet clothes off before they get pneumonia. Because in Ohio, 22 degrees, you're going to get pneumonia. Well, I forgot to tell you, it wasn't 22 degrees when the men took their stand Sabbath morning. It was 55 degrees. And it's a place like Ohio where we can drop as much as 40 degrees in just a matter of hours. And that's what had happened. By the time we had Sabbath dinner and went out to baptize, it had dropped to 22 degrees. They had the thing there with the, the little heater going. And my brother-in-law was the head deacon. I said, Frank, are you ready for this? He said, well, we've never done this before. He said, it's truly cold. Look at the people there. They're standing on the banks. and They had all these heavy overcoats and the mufflers and the scarves and gloves. And old CD was standing there. He had a beret on. I've got a picture of this. And you can see him standing there. My brother-in-law and I took each other's hand and we stood there on the riverbank and we had a prayer. God, this is a real, real bad situation. That was a handicap, wasn't it? 22 degrees. He said, but Lord, these men are so convinced they need confirmation in you today. You've got to work a miracle for us. We started wading out into that river and it was bone chilling. We got out into the center of the stream. And as we stood there and had a prayer, I always have a prayer and ask the Lord to baptize me again when I'm about to have a baptism. So you don't know that. When you see me bow my head in the pool like I did not at Wike and I, I was asking God to rebaptize me. He does. Every time I do it, he rebaptizes me. Yeah, two weeks later, I was out in the Pacific Ocean there off of Christ Church, and I asked him to do it again. He was faithful. He baptized me all over again. I love it. This is not for you. This is for me. And as we prayed this prayer, Rain, we were holding hands, and I said, Amen. And my brother-in-law said, Do you feel that? And I said, Yeah, I sure do. And out of the bottom of that creek, with ice around the bank, heat started to move up our feet, ankles, legs, knees, hips, right up under my armpits. We stood there looking at each other, eyes getting large. I said, God's doing something, isn't he? He said, yes, man. And we started to sweat. <laughs> isn't that amazing? We were perspiring, watching the people on the bank just shivering. I said to the deaconess, Send us a first candidate. Down he came into the water. And we went through the whole ritual. We didn't rush it. And he stood there and he felt it. What would you do out here, Pastor? <laughs> Said it wasn't me. It was Jesus. We took him down and brought him up and raced him off toward the bank. And they spread open and let him through. And he jumped in the caravan and ripped off those clothing. And we did all three of the brethren that way and got them all back safely. Not one of them even got a sniffle, nor I, nor the head deacon. We had a few coals on the bank. <laughs> there is no handicap in this life that God cannot overcome. All we need is the faith. That's what's lacking. Our faith, our trust in him. He is able. He is equal to any situation that will arise in your life. Would you give yourself to him tonight? If you really trust God, if you want him to overcome those handicaps, whether they be mental or physical or whatever they might be, I want you to stand on your feet tonight and give yourself to him in full and complete surrender. I don't care if you've done it four other times this week. It's time to do it tonight because this is a new subject. We're talking about handicaps now, and we want God to move them back. Don't waste, waste God. Stand on your knees. Lord, why do we distrust you so much? Why do we doubt you? Why do we argue with you when you give us direction? Why do we hesitate? Each of us have to admit, Lord, in our heart of hearts, 
There is a wealth of evidence that you can do what you say. You're never short. You never come up missing. You're not an absentee God. Give us more trust. Give us more faith. Help us to minister in our own homes first. For there are broken and discouraged souls that live right there with us. Mend the bridges, Lord, between spouses. Fix those things that ail us. And then remove our doubts about our abilities, our handicaps. Loose us, I pray, Father, with the gifts that you have given us. Empower us and remind us that you'll be with us. And if necessary, you'll be with our mouths. You'll be with our feet. You'll be with our hands. You'll be with our eyes. Whatever is needed, we can count on you to supply it. Oh, Lord, give us faith. Give us trust. Diminish our handicaps, both real and imagined. So that when you come, you'll find a people that's working and happy to be working. A people that's witnessing and happy to be witnessing. And Lord, when we reach out to do this, I ask you to give us results which will strengthen our faith even further. We belong to you. We stand here tonight, Lord, to reaffirm that fact. Take us as we are and make us what you'd have us to be. Grant us your peace and your salvation. In the name of the Father, and of your blessed Son, Jesus, and in the name of the comforting Holy Spirit, that all the church say, Amen. Amen. Got a song for us to end on? Great.
take us to our several places of abode. Give us a night of peace and rest in thee. Refresh us on the morrow to confront the challenges and to receive the blessings that you have in store for each of us. To you, our loving Father, we say good night. Good night, and God bless you. Thank you, friends. Thank you.